Well, good morning. It's great to be together with you. And even though it's via technology, we know that God is here in our midst because he says that where two or three gather in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So welcome to everyone. And we want to talk a little bit this morning about a vision for a future by design. We need to understand that God is the one who has given us this new year and a future by design is not necessarily a future by the world's design. It's not a future by tech design, which seems to be the, the, the key word that's going on around out there. It's about God's design. Because the most important design this morning that we can have, folks, is to be in line with God's design. And God created the world, and He is in charge of it. He knows what's coming. He knows where it's been. He knows His plan for it. In fact, He says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, as... Uh, Paul speaks to us, he says, the wisdom of this world, even the technological advances that we're talking about, is foolishness with God. Now, can you imagine that? Everything that the world is holding on to as their latest and greatest, God says, that's foolishness. For it's written that he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And so this morning, as we spend some time together, just looking at God's word, I want to encourage you to get ready for the year of your life. 2020 is going to be the year of your life. It's not the 1920s, it's the 2020s. And this is the decade that God has given us to impact our nation and impact the continent of Africa. I want to share a, a, a word with you. When I looked at the, the number 2020 and had a look at the Hebrew uh, description of that, the Hebrew word is El Roy. And uh, Elroy means the God who sees. The God who sees. That's the name that 2020 carries with it. So if you are concerned about what lies ahead in this year, then I want to encourage you that the God who sees is the one who goes before us. He knows what's coming. He knows where the challenges are and he knows how to guide us around them. And our job is to stay in touch with him and to do what he has called us to do. Now, before we go a lot further, I want to suggest that what we do is a quick math problem. All right, just to keep our brains, brains nice and sharp this morning, uh, a quick math problem. And I'd like to ask you if you could just work out in your mind, what is the difference between 32 and 12? 32 and 12. I'm sure all the math boffins have got it just like that. But uh, if you came up with the answer 20, then I'm sorry you're wrong. Because the, the difference between 32 and 12 is the Rugby World Cup. I'll just leave that for you for a moment. The Rugby World Cup in the hands of the South Africans. 32 to us, 12 to England, and we are victorious. So things are not always the way that they seem. They can be different. And our job this morning is to make sure that we are ready for anything that God sends our way. So, I did some research and I discovered that uh, when they train people in the use of air defense systems in the military, what they do is they take two groups of people. The first group, they put them into this uh, simulation system and they give them the same problem over and over and over again. And what happens is, those uh, soldiers or those uh, troops get used to being able to deal with that problem. And so they get really good. They get expert at it. Another group that they put out there is a group that gets a different challenge every single time that something comes into that screen. It's not the same problem they're facing. It's a totally different problem. And an interesting fact emerged, and that is that when they tested the two groups against each other, in a, conf a, a controlled area, the, the group that had got the same problem over and over again beat the other group hands down because they knew exactly what was coming and they were able to deal with it. But when they got into the battlefield, the group that had the experience of dealing with whatever came their way beat the controlled group hands down. And why am I sharing that with us this morning? Because I believe it's so true in our ministries, in our schools, is that we are going to experience different things that are going to come at us 
during 2020. But our training is of such a nature that we realize we don't, we don't rely on just the, the conditions or the circumstance or the same problem coming over and over again. We realize that the problems can be different, but the God is the same. Our Lord is the same. The one who leads us and guides us, He is the same over and over and over again. He's proved that to us. So Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 says, as Paul speaks to the Galatians, he says, I say then to you, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What's he saying? He's saying, be ready, equipped with the ability to deal with any challenge that comes your way, not with the experience that you've gained over the years, because there will be a different experience or a different challenge that may come your way, that God is wanting you to be ready to trust Him so that you can fulfill His plan. God, our Heavenly Father, has already seen the future. He is Elroy. He is the God who sees. He's the God who knows the future. He knows exactly what lies ahead of us, whether it's in our country, whether it's in our education departments or, or system, whether it's in your school or church, God knows exactly what's coming ahead in 2020. And He wants us to navigate safely as we go forward in the knowledge that we are His children and that He's our God and that He is the one that by His Holy Spirit is going to lead and guide us every step of the way. All that's required from us is to be obedient to God and to the guiding of His Holy Spirit every single day. It's a story that I'm sure you are very well uh, uh, acquainted with, and that's a story of a fisherman or a group of fishermen that uh, had gone out to go and catch some fish. And Luke records this for us in Luke chapter 5 and verse 5. Let me read it to you. It says, One day, from verse 1, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. In the King James Version, it says, Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. We all know that story so, uh, uh, so well from the Bible and and we've probably thought about it in many different ways. But I want to highlight for us this morning that Peter and his friends were professional fishermen. This was their livelihood. This is what they had learned to do all their lives. They were experts at fishing. They had the right boats. They had the right nets. They had the right expertise and experience. They had everything that they needed to catch the fish. The only problem was there was no fish. Now, I do a bit of fishing from time to time and I can relate because I've gone down there and I've thrown the line into the sea and I've waited while people on either side of me are catching fish left, right and center. My uh, bait and hook seems to be immune to the fish that are in the sea. And it's very frustrating to walk back after a day's fishing with a fishing rod and no fish. That's exactly where these... Uh, Men came back to shore after fishing the whole night and they discovered or realized that they hadn't caught a fish. You see, what Peter could have done is he could have said to Jesus, please give us more stamina so that we can keep on fishing the way that we've always fished. Keep on, just give us more strength so we can go out there and keep on doing what we've always done. Maybe that's where you're at at your school today. He's saying, we've always done this. We're going to keep on doing it. We, and, and maybe you're experiencing the same frustration of an empty net because it's being done out of our expertise, not out of obedience to what God is wanting from us every single moment of the day. Peter realized that all his professional habits and his professional experience 
had not produced the goods. Is that where you are today? You're doing everything by the book. You're doing everything the way that you've always done it. And somehow you just don't seem to be getting the results. Perhaps the issue is not simply what's being done. It's the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to understand what God is saying and what He wants in each and every one of our schools. Because you see, we're dealing with the most um, uh, uh, valuable commodity, which is the lives of young people. And we need God's input to be able to impact their lives. Jesus gives Peter a simple, irrational and illogical command. He says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And, and I could just see Peter standing there and saying, of course, <laughs> that's the problem. We should have cast on the other side of the boat. Now, you understand, fish don't swim on just one side of the boat and not on the other. It had nothing to do with the side of the boat. It had to do with Peter's obedience to the command of Jesus, who said, go and do it this way. You'll be amazed at what's going to result from that. Jesus said to Peter, go and do exactly what you've been doing all night long. And this time, be obedient to my command. So forget your, your professional expertise. Forget everything else. This is not a clever fishing tip. This is obedience to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we know what happened. As they went out there, they dropped the nets on the other side. And amazingly, 153 fish were in those nets in no time at all. And what happened was they had to call another boat to come and help. Because you see, when God's work is done God's way, then we see the increase. We see the, the, the results. We see the, the harvest on what He's doing. And perhaps... You've been laboring and laboring and laboring. And you say 2020 is just another year that we're going to go through with the same challenges we're experiencing. And I've got news for you. I've got news for you. If we're able to tune our hearts and spirits to what God is saying, then we're going to experience an amazing breakthrough in education in this nation. This is the time that God has raised us up to be salt and to be light in this nation. Education is in crisis. And God hasn't put us here just to occupy some space. He's put us here to be the godly solution. We've heard all the furore about comprehensive sexual education that's happening out there. And people, both Christian and non-Christian, are opposing it because of the content that is going to be passed on to young children who have no place being taught information like that. But you see, getting upset about it is one thing, but getting ready to do something and saying, God, what would you have us do in this situation to bring about a change? That's what we need to be hearing God's Spirit for. Not to do something out of a, 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 a political agenda, but to do it out of a godly agenda, to say, God, I want to do this so that the next generation can be impacted positively. You know, the stories of faith are are out there in the Bible. Back in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has just uh, uh, killed the, the prophets of Baal, had an amazing victory, and uh, the country is in drought. And I love what Elijah does. He says to King Ahab, he says, go and get ready because there is an abundance of rain. Now, they haven't had rain for a very long time. There's a drought in the land. He says, go and get ready because there's a, a, a sound of an abundance of rain coming at us. And then the Bible says, Elijah goes and puts his head between his knees. And he says to his servant, go up onto the, 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 the rock and tell me what you see. And so his servant goes up and comes back the first time. He says, nothing. I don't see a thing. Now imagine Elijah is like, but God, you should have, you should have brought the, I, I've done, I've killed the prophets of Baal. I've done everything you've asked me to do. Now, now, now where's the rain? No, Elijah says, go a second time. And so he goes a second time, and, and he goes a third time. He goes a seventh time, and on the seventh time he comes back, and he says, Master, there is a cloud the size of a man's fist. He says, run. Get to Ahab and tell him that he better get moving, lest he get caught up in all the water and the floods that are coming. You see, that faith that God places in Elijah to speak life into the situation is the same faith that we have this morning. 
is to be able to speak life into the situation. Not all the negativity that so often comes across our lips and say, oh, woe is us. We've got all these challenges coming our way. No. He says, we need to be ready to be the salt and the light that God causes us to be, has called us to be. The Lord woke me up one morning a couple of weeks ago and, 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 and he gave me two words. And I want to share those with you this morning as we consider our activities for the way ahead. We all know Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the great commandment is that we need to raise up our children in the ways of the Lord and to teach them the ways of the Lord. And sometimes we forget the next section of Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's from verse 10. He says, when you've taught your children, when you've brought them up in the ways of the Lord, verse 10 says, so it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give you. Okay, he said, I promised I will give this to you. Large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Houses full of good things which you did not fill. You not wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you are, have eaten and are full, then beware. He says, here's the warning. Then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out from the land of Egypt. From the house of bondage, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Folks, we live in a materialistic world that says it's what you've got that matters. I want to tell you this morning, it's not what you've got, it's who you know. It's who you obey. It's who you are willing to acknowledge is the source of everything that you have in your school, in your ministry, in your life. God is the source. The two words that God laid on my heart were these. Obedience and abundance. Obedience and abundance. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says this, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. In other words, be obedient to the call of God on your life, on your ministry, in your school, and what God wants to have happen there, and not on what you want to have happen there. So easy for us to just say, God, if you could just wait there, I think we've got it from here. He says, no, obedience is... Is where it's at seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you all of what things all of those building projects you've been praying for all of the breakthroughs you've been praying for for parents to pay their school fees that's what you've been praying for all of these challenges that are out there that seem to occupy all our time Jesus says I tell you what you've got your priorities mixed up Get to where you are seeking the kingdom of God and you will see all of these things being added to you. So, obedience is the gate to God's abundance. When we are obedient to God's word, we are obedient to God's voice, we are obedient to God's Holy Spirit in the same way as Peter was obedient to Jesus when he said, go back out there and put your net down on the other side of the boat. He saw the abundance that was supernatural. And you can continue the way you've always continued, the way you've always gone, and say, well, we're just going to keep at it. God, give us stamina as we keep on fishing on this side of the boat. Please, God, bring some fish. Bring, bring, let them swim on this side. And, and we can do the research and we can find out why sw fish swim on the wrong side of the boat or the wrong, right side of the boat. It's got nothing to do with it. God says, I want obedience in your life. I want obedience in that school. Are you spending that time together as a, as a team praying and saying, God, what is your will for our school this year? The God who sees, we're, we're, we're calling out to you and saying, God, what do you want for our school this morning? What do you want us to do? Very often we spend all our time figuring out how we're going to get the admin done or how we're going to overcome these problems or deal with the, the lack of fish but I believe that God says to us this morning if you will be obedient 
then you're going to experience showers of blessing. You're going to experience the abundance. You're going to experience the 153 fish that you can't contain on your own because it's not about your ability. It's about your obedience this morning. And I want to encourage us as we go into this day, as we share many things, uh, God has put us together as a family to be able to stand together shoulder to shoulder and to be a solution in education in South Africa that will come into its own in a way that we've never experienced before. I know that God is going to give us supernatural favor across the board in education. I know that we are going to experience breakthroughs that could never be done through our professionalism or our experience. It's going to be done through our obedience to what God says. Let me also caution you that when God speaks and He says, I want you to do something, it's usually not the way that we want to do it. It's usually not the, the, the logical or the rational way to do it. It's usually totally different so that if it ever works, God will only be the only one that can get the glory for it. I would love to have been on the shore that day as the fishermen came back with the 153 fish and everybody crowded around them and said, what is your secret? Tell us, how did you get all these fish into the boat and, 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 and what can we do to duplicate this experience? For Peter to stand up and said, follow him, obey him, do whatever he says and all these things will be added unto you. That's my encouragement to us as we move into this year of great opportunity. We need to know that the God who sees goes before us. And I want to challenge you, each and every one this morning, to commit to obeying God in every situation, irrespective of how irrational and illogical the idea or the thought might seem. Because you see, when, when human intellect gets involved, it tends to move us away from obedience to experience. But it's the obedience of God that opens the gates of abundance. When we know how to do God's work, God's way, that's when we experience God's blessing in our lives. And I know that God's got great things in store for us as Christian educators and as those that have dedicated their lives to the cause of the gospel and impacting the next generation. May the Lord lead us and guide us in every single step of the way so that He would be glorified and the net result will be that young people will be drawn into the kingdom of God through our efforts. May God bless you and enjoy the day.